Thank you. So good morning, and I'm very happy to be here uh, in this workshop because uh, drug shortages has been a very an issue that's been close to my heart for the last about two three years uh, in one of my research streams and. I know that I'm speaking in a panel where I'm supposed to be talking about uh, my experiences from other industries. Actually, I'm going to be kind of the unruly child, and I'm going to talk mostly about my experience within the drug shortages and pharmaceuticals. Uh, so I've, had, I've been working in uh, humanitarian systems, humanitarian supply chains, uh, emergency response supply chains, and supply chain resilience in general for about a decade now. So, uh, but I, I, I think uh, some of the work that we have been doing at Northeastern with a large group of faculty and students on uh, pharmaceutical supply chains and uh, the, resi uh, the shortages that we have been experiencing in the U.S. on drug uh, is kind of, might be of interest to you. Uh, so this work uh, that I'm going to be talking about mostly is actually funded by NSF on a grant that's uh, finishing up very soon, and this grant helped us to put together a big group of people uh, coming from faculties of uh, industrial engineering, computer science, psychology, gaming, I'll tell you why gaming is relevant in a second, uh, to actually put together a framework where we can actually analyze these complex supply chain issues and behavioral issues that might be leading into uh, prolonged and multiple drug shortages in the US. So I know that uh, everybody knows this in this workshop probably that we have actually without disasters, without uh, big disruptions that might be happening as, the, as happened last year with Maria and, and the other two hur big hurricanes, we actually had a growing epidemic of drug shortages in the United States. So if you look at the chart on the, on the left hand side, uh, to your left, is, uh, is the number of new drug shortages reported uh, in the last, uh, since 2000. And what you see is that we actually have more and more uh, drugs coming into shortage uh, than historically. So saline and uh, sterile fluids is something that was in the headlines uh, recently, you know, over the last year and a half. And the, the fact is though, before Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico and closed down uh, several of the, two of the big, uh, big facilities there, actually saline and similar products has been in shortage in like different packaging sites and so on and so forth for a while. So one question of course is that how can, like for a drug that's so critical and in use in so many cases, uh, how will, how is it possible that you have a lot of your production facility as a nation in an island that's actually prone to hurricanes? Uh, of course, uh, if one was to understand, like wanted to understand the root causes of these issues, as my good friend Julie just pointed out to me before this panel, you really need to also look at these kind of issues. Why, was these, why were these plants located in Puerto Rico? What are the economic factors that are driving these uh, location of production facilities? How many manufacturing plants exist? Uh, so for example, the sterile fluids are very low margin products, so nobody really wants to manufacture them, I think, uh, and that's one of the issues. But anyway, I know that we have been talking about these, so I'm not gonna talk about um, uh, too much about the background here. But I just want to say that, of course, supply chain disruptions is common to many, many different industries. After the earthquakes in Japan, uh, Toyota and a lot of the other Japanese car, uh, car manufacturers were in severe shortage of parts. Uh, we know about the Puerto Rico and the saline uh, shortages, but then uh, several uh, years ago, during the holidays, there was a big crisis because there was no whipped cream left for Christmas. Uh, it was completely due to supply chain issues and it just didn't exist. And this year, I don't know if you've heard this on NPR or, or read it on other uh, you know, news outlets that KFC in Britain actually ran out of chicken. And, and then I think they ran out of gravy afterwards. Uh, for several months or several weeks, they had to close down all of theirs, almost all of their stores in England. And it was due to changing suppliers and then things that not working out. So this is like a pressing issue in supply chain. So it's not like drugs are not unique in a sense. 
And, uh, you know, as if you look at the academic literature, there has been quite a few works in supply chain disruptions, looking at evaluating impact of disruptions, looking at mitigation uh, strategies such as how and how much should you place inventories, where should you place inventories, how should you do your sourcing, how should you adjust to demand flexibility, or how should you actually look at demand flexibility, facility location, and there is also quite a bit of academic work in detecting disruption. So, right, I mean, so we want to also understand when something is coming, because I would say one of the issues in the drug shortages is that a lot of things happen to actually cascade into a big shortage, and mostly FDA, CDC, and, and uh, the providers are sometimes are surprised when something happens, like a shortage happens, because there wasn't actually a big event like Maria. So there's, there is some work on this in academia. Um, and my uh, kind of comment on that is that in the drug supply chains, uh, it's, the drug supply chain is a complex supply chain, it's a global supply chain, and usually shortages happen as an outcome of cascading events and not one single event. So if you look at the drug supply chain, you know, this is a simple schema. I know that there was another one, I think, yesterday, but we have the suppliers who who are important, you know, bringing in the materials, then the manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, uh, pharmacies or hospitals, and the patients. And then you could have side, side lines that are going into packaging and so on and so forth. The thing is, we can have disruptions or events happening, not, uh, not huge events, but minor events happening in all parts of the supply chain. So we can have custom problems, we can have recalls or manufacturing suspensions, uh, we can have transportation delays, and uh, we can have inventory policies or not limited capacity at the, uh, at the health, health servers. Uh, the demand could spike due to flu season. And uh, also, this is a system, I think Jared mentioned this, it's a socio-technical system where there are a lot of humans, there's behavior issues, and these behavioral issues can actually make a shortage happen when it wasn't really necessarily needed, you know, like it, it could have been avoided. Uh, so one thing that I want to bring up and put here is that in, uh, so this was a survey that was done by the uh, International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering in 2016. Uh, and one thing that you should get from here is that 52% uh, of the shortages in 2016 were considered as unknown cause. You know? And so what does that mean? To me, it means that the causes were probably multiple and the drug shortage happened because all of these things came together at the right time to create the perfect storm. So how do we understand like when something might happen is a big question. Uh, so I would, I, I would like to point out a few things that makes this drug uh, supply chain a complex system. So first of all, there is the disruption location complexity. What I mean by that is that Okay, when something happens, this, let's say at the distributor or that kind of middle echelon, uh, which is a supplier to the Blue Hospital, we know that usually the, the, the shortage might happen and affect patients at that Blue Hospital. However, something might happen at the, the, the Blue Middle node there, the distributor, let's say, and one would expect that things will happen at the yellow hospital, but actually because of the network effects and interacting uh, nature of the supply chains that we might actually end up having, oops, okay, I skipped the slide. I mean, I, I'll come back to this, but I don't know how to go back. Can I go, okay. So what might happen is actually, be, uh, although there are no direct connections between the blue distributor and the blue hospital, we might actually have more patients affecting, I'm okay, I think, yeah, I, I figured it, yeah, thank you. Uh, we might actually see effects, larger effects in the blue hospital. So how do we understand that? What kind of a framework or, or kind of a network understanding we have to develop to actually anticipate that things might be going wrong in the Blue Hospital as well. Uh, so again, looking at some data, uh, we have some data from IQVIA uh, for antibiotics and chemotherapy drugs, uh, oncology drugs for six years, and this chart here, just to show you, 
uh, the top four warehouses within the United States uh, serving states. So which uh, warehouse serves which state? And what we see here is, and the color coding is each color uh, corresponds to a state, uh, sorry, corresponds to a warehouse. So what we see here is that really a, a big warehouse could be serving customers all over the United States. So if something goes wrong, either with that warehouse or its suppliers, then we expect effects all around the country. Uh, there is the disruption time complexity, meaning that if a disruption happens briefly, if, even if the total same size disruption happens in a brief, briefly in a, in a short time period, versus the same kind of a disruption but happening over a longer time period will have a different impact on the supply chain. Same will happen if the sizes of the disruptions are different. Same, again, you'll have different types of impacts if you have one single continuous disruption versus two different uh, disruptions happening with a break, with a short break, with a long break. So what I'm trying to, oh, sorry. So what I would like to say here is that every one of these different disruption profiles will affect your supply chain in a different way. And what that means is that if you're looking at supply chain strategies, we really need to have strategies that are adaptive. So one strategy is not really going to be enough because you first we have to understand what's happening, what kind of a disruption we're you know, seeing, then we have to have an idea of what kind of an adaptive policy do we have to apply given the disruption profile. Uh, other thing that's happening, I, and I'm not going to spend too much time on here, but again, looking at the same data set, we see that a lot of drugs move and get into shortage in, in a correlated way. So this is just one, uh, this is just a couple of antibiotics. Uh, but what we also see is like, uh, there are certain medical products, for example, after the, uh, the saline shortage, Boston Children's Hospital ran into a syringe shortage because everybody started using syringes instead of the bags, and then they ran out of syringes. So how can we use maybe historic data or some other understanding to discover these patterns in the historic data and kind of expect that these disruptions or correlated events might be happening in the future too so that we're kind of ready for it? Uh, again, there is, this is a human in the loop system, so there are a lot of behavioral issues that are happening uh, when we're looking at ordering policies, allocation policies, and inventory policies. Uh, so different disruption patterns cause different effects. To analyze that, my group at Northeastern, for example, came up with a system dynamics model. I'm so happy that Jared actually mentioned it. <laughs> so I'm not the only kind of the geek in the room. <laughs> or the mathematician in the room, but these system dynamics models are really helpful to understand impacts of uh, different uh, type of event, events happening in a complex system. So what I want to, I'm actually going to skip it and come here. So one thing that we see from our system dynamics model is, for example, to see that um, if the same uh, level of a recall happens, uh, but happens in, as a single continuous disruption versus, um, sorry, si disruption, brief disruption versus a prolonged disruption, but just one single disruption. So the total shortage is uh, much larger if the event happens in a brief time period, okay? So that kind of makes sense, but look at the next one. So again, the same level of disruption happens but as two disruptions, one with a short break in between and the other one with a long break in between. What we see is, for example, that two disruptions happening back to back, but as a, uh, as in a shorter period, is actually better in terms of shortages than a long break. So we actually happen to see some of these, uh, some of these impacts in these complex systems that are not so evident, right? So we really actually have to model these systems and try to understand what happens and why it happens because sometimes we come into insights that are counterintuitive, okay? And, uh, and the, the next thing I want to say is we've talked about, as Jared again talked about Sentinel nodes and to me those are critical nodes. So supply chains is a network. Right? And, but it's a network that, is, uh, that has decisions, humans, inventories, and flows, and information that goes over the network. 
So network science community has been looking at these large scale and complex networks from a connectivity point of view, which means that which node is connected to somebody, which other nodes, and tr are trying to understand criticality of these nodes. What we claim is that this is great, but to understand the criticality of nodes in supply chains, you need to build onto that. You cannot just look at um, connectivity, you also have to look at things like uh, you know, uh, how much inventory each node is holding, uh, if this is a, what are the flows over time, and so on and so forth. So in my research group, one thing that we do is actually come up with these new network measures, and somebody mentioned uh, inventory as a measure, like putting into the, uh, into the measures, and that's exactly what we're trying to do, come up with new, new network measures that actually includes critical elements of a supply chain to understand which nodes we should monitor and which nodes we should maybe strengthen, okay? And I know that my time is up. I'm just going to mention one more thing. Uh, so the other thing that we have done is that we have generated a general simulation framework, which uh, in the middle we have a flow simulator, which uh, simulates the physical and the information flow in a supply chain. And this is a modular system where we can build the supply chain in any way that we want. Uh, and then, uh, and then on the on the right hand side here, we have a, a theory of mind model, which models how humans make decisions. Okay, so these are the computer science and psychologists who helped us build that. So here, by building these uh, decision making frameworks, we're actually able to understand what happens when people are not behaving rationally or how trust is changing given different disruptions happening in the system, and then. On the, on the left-hand side, we've also made a gaming server. And what does that mean is the following, is that we're actually uh, build a game where we can actually in, insert different, role, uh, different people into different roles into the simulator, uh, playing a different role in our simulator, okay? So this is useful in, in several ways. So for example, with this kind of a framework, we're able to put in humans into different roles and then measure and kind of record the way that they have reacted to certain things that are happening within the supply chain. Uh, and then we can actually update our theory of mind, like the, it was, was our decision-making model good? It was it rep representing really how humans behave. And the second thing, and I think this, this community might be interested in that, is that we can actually use these gamets, gaming modules, to train people, right? To see what is the impact of information sharing, for example. So like if we want to convince people to share information or to act together or to train anybody in what some aspect of the supply chain, we might actually use these kind of gaming frameworks that are integrated with a simulator to uh, show them the impact of different, uh, different policies or different, uh, different actions they might be taking. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, so there are like, so for example, with this framework is, you know, this is just like, we have just completed the framework, we are running experiments, but you know, we see certain things that are uh, somewhat obvious, such as we have, uh, if you allocate proportionally and your downstream customers know that, you, you usually end up in hoarding. Uh, but what we also see is like, if, if you share more information and if you give the capability of uh, forward planning into your decision makers, so like not really thinking about just two periods, but think about the next month, actually the entire system benefits, even if one decision maker is more foresighted than the others. So there are really different things that we're able to see within this framework. Uh, so we're also looking at ongoing experiments, looking at the impact of information, impact of different types of disruption profiles, and such things like impact of trust, how do you model trust, how does trust change with different, like if you share more information with your downstream customers, does that mean that uh, you're actually gaining more trust, although your service level might be staying the same? Does that help you with your market share, future, uh, you know, future uh, interactions and so on? So those are the things like we're doing uh, at this point and I would, you know, I'm, as, as we said, like this is a big project that's going on at Northeastern. We have developed the framework at this point, and we would be very happy to talk, interact, collaborate with anybody who's interested in this audience. Thank you.